Hey horror fans, welcome back to Room 237, and this isn't a Clive Barker marathon, but I did Midnight Me Train, then I did Book of Blood, and I decided to rewatch this one again because this is one of my favorite Clive Barker films, or stories, he didn't actually direct it, he was the executive producer, but it's based on his story, 1992's Candyman. And I was going to save this for when the remake, reboot, whatever came out. But of course, everything is on hold. And definitely now, so I don't know when I'll get to see it. But uh, Candyman is a film that <clears throat> my whole life I kind of put off. I just didn't really... It, I wasn't really that interested and I'd seen a bunch of other movies with Tony Todd. And I've said before, I'm not the biggest Tony Todd fan. Just every movie, he just seems to kind of um, whisper. And, you know, he's just Tony Todd. I'm just not the biggest fan of him. So I really had no interest in seeing this. But then, it was probably about eight years ago at this point. I was like, well, fuck it. Let's just check it out. So I went out and I got it. And I'm not a fan of this cover at all. I I much prefer the original cover. You know, I think that's a much cooler cover. And I really like this film. I like everything about it. I like the kind of story it is, which I'll get into Love the direction by uh, Bernard Rose. Love the score by uh, Philip Glass. Just one of my favorite film scores, actually. Uh, whether it be the, the main theme, the one piece that the piano kind of sounds like Silent Hill, but not really. <clears throat> I... I love I like the urban legend, the the story of Candyman, like the character himself. I love how they didn't show it. It really helped with what they were trying to do. <clears throat> and <clears throat> you know, it really really helped become like the face of you know, the newer kind of horror villain. You know, the sort of normal-looking, intelligent, very elegant kind of horror villain. Whether it be him or Hannibal Lecter. You know, the sort of masked killers of the 80s were kind of gone. Except for Ghostface from Scream. And the 90s brought in a whole new style of horror villain. And I just really like... <clears throat> the story and it's based on the short story The Forbidden by Clive Barker which was collected in his first collection of A Book of Blood and it's basically about this woman named Helen played by Virginia Madsen who's been in a lot of stuff her and her friend um, <clears throat> Bernadette played by was it Casey Williams uh of Casey Lemons, excuse me. It takes place in Chicago because, you know, Clyde Barker has a thing for more contemporary settings. Like, he finds uh, cities and suburban areas scarier than, like, the Gothic Transylvania castle or the cemetery or whatever. They go to the university in Chicago and they're doing a thesis on urban legends. <clears throat> and they keep hearing this story about Candyman. This legend where if you say his name five times in the mirror, he'll come out and get you. We see a couple instances. Like one, this woman has this sort of biker dude over played by Ted Raimi. And... They start looking into these articles, how people at Cabrini Green, the um, uh, housing project in Chicago, people keep dying mysteriously. 
And Virginia Madsen finds this one article about how her apartment building was sort of like the template for what Cabrini Green was going to be. And how, so the apartments are very identical. And how, like, the only thing separating the apartments in the bathroom, there's like a medicine cabinet, then another medicine cabinet, and the next apartment, and that's the only thing. You know, there's really no walls or anything. So she thinks that's how the killer got in to kill this other woman at Cabrini Green. Of course, she says Candyman five times. Then they go to Cabrini Green to look around. <clears throat> and basically, <clears throat> like there was this other boy who was in the bathroom house, which is outside at Cabrini Green. He was castrated and believed to be killed by Candyman. And she's attacked by this one gang leader who calls himself Candyman. He gets arrested. And he, you know, gets charged with the young boy and the girl that they were looking into at the one apartment. So then the whole sort of Candyman urban legend goes away because they believe they found him. And because of that, sort of like Freddy Krueger, he's lost his power. So he uses Helen, Virginia Madsen, as kind of a vehicle to instill the Candyman legend again. And, you know, bringing her on just a trail of murder and, of course, she doesn't remember any of it, which is kind of a slow burn. It's quite a while before we actually see Tony Todd as Candyman for the first time. I really like the look of him you know, because the story is back in 1890 I think it was this young African American was the son of a slave who invented this advice that could help mass produce shoes. So his father became very wealthy. He went to all the best schools. He was very well educated. Got to live amongst high society. He was a talented artist. Especially in portraits. And this one guy had him come paint his white daughter. And they fell in love. And ang angry about that. He got this posse together to grab Candyman, drag him through the city, cut off his right hand. Nearby there was a bee farm. They smeared his body with honey and he was stung to death. And then sometime later, just I'm guessing because of the tragedy of his death, he became this urban legend. And he has a hook on the bloody stump. And the, the look of Candyman, other than the bloody stump, he's very normal looking. They don't really do anything with Tony Todd's face. He's very much a normal looking human being. But he's, Tony Todd, he's tall. He's intimidating. He comes from wealth, so he's very well dressed. This very big fur coat. And of course, bees play a part. The bees are like inside of him. Like he opens up his coat. You can see his rib cage and it's just swarm of bees that can come out of his mouth even in the opening during the credits when we're just seeing the layout of the city and we get a voiceover by Tony Todd we see like this swarm of bees around the whole city which I'm guessing the urban legend is everywhere because like the girl with Ted Raimi was in like some suburban area but he really seems to like his Elm Street or his Crystal Lake or his Haddonfield it is the Cabrini Green housing development. And I don't really know if you would put this under like the psycho stalker genre, but like the newer Invisible Man that came out this year, which I thought was an excellent movie. 
<clears throat> you know, the Invisible Man is doing all these things to the main character, killing people around her, doing all this shit, so that she looks responsible, and she's claiming there's some Invisible Man doing it, making her look crazy. It's sort of the same thing here, and I really like movies that do this, where the central character... There is some sort of unstoppable, unbelievable force that's doing or making her do all these things. And no one believes her. And she just kind of gets put through the rat... Uh, I almost said put through the rabbit hole. She's put through the ringer of everything that the actual killer is doing. And Virginia Madsen does a great job. And, like, the things that happen to her, like, first time she sees Candyman, whenever she sees him, she goes into a trance, and then she wakes up with someone Candyman murdered, but with the circumstances, it looks like she actually did it. Like, this one woman that she talked to at Cabrini Green, who, she's a waitress with a, a baby. She killed her dog and took her baby and of course, everyone thinks she did it. Then her friend Bernadette gets killed. Everyone thinks she did it. Um, I know, sound terrible again. <clears throat> um, and pretty much she's on the run trying to figure everything out. I mean, she even gets sent to a mental hospital. And there's just these scenes like... She wants to prove it to this one doctor who's working in her defense. She says Candyman in the mirror. She's strapped to a wheelchair. He guts him with the hook from behind. And you're thinking, oh, how could she do that if she's strapped? Which Candyman frees her restraints. So it's all this shit that he's making happen to make it look like she's doing it. But also trying to resurrect his legend status. And of course the, the pinnacle of it all is Cabrini Green. Every whenever they put all their junk in one big pile to have a big bonfire. And you know since he was using Helican. Wow. Helican. I'm tired. Using Helen as a vehicle. He thinks if he puts the baby in this pile, and she agrees to go on this path with him, their power will be greater. And then also we see a mural that says, It's always been you, Helen, because Cabrini Green's covered in graffiti. Where it shows Candyman being tortured by people in the 1800s. And we see this blonde woman that looks just like her. So we get the idea that either she's a descendant or just someone that really looks like her. I like to see when she first, first gets to Cabrini Green. She climbs through this hole in the wall. And when she gets to the other side, it's this big mural of Candyman with his mouth open. That's what she crawls through. But of course, she does get the baby out back to the mother. She's kind of deemed a hero. I always thought the ending was going back and forth because at her funeral, of course, just her cheating husband and his new girlfriend is there. But then the whole residence of Karina Green goes to her grave, including the mother of the baby and this young boy, Jake. That she talks to. He has the hook. And they drop it into her grave. I always thought. That they believed. She really was Candyman. And responsible for everything. But I'm guessing. They. They accept the fact. That she was set up. And that she was trying to help. The whole time. Which. I mean, I'm guessing the mother was there when the baby was taken. And the mother even attacked her for thinking she took or killed her baby. But whatever. And then it ends with her husband saying her name five times in the mirror. Sort of 
out in mourning. And then she shows up and kills him. And then we see a mural of her and Cabrini Green. So she went from doing a thesis on urban legends to being the victim of one to becoming one. And really like the story. I would say this in the first Hellraiser. I even like the first two Hellraisers quite a bit. But I know the first one is really Clive Barker. Like his story. I would say those two are my favorite Clive Barker stories. This one, because Barker is a fan of um, gothic horror. And one of the things of gothic horror is you add a lot of tragedy. And Candyman is a tragic monster. And they did a good job with that. The score is phenomenal. I love the score so much. The direction is great. And I will say, Virginia Madsen does a great job regardless. But the scenes where she's in a trance in the presence of Candyman, she was actually hypnotized. Because Bernard Rose thought the best way to get her sort of in that state was to hypnotize her. So they found someone to do it. And she was under hypnosis. Especially the one in the parking garage when we first see Candyman. Works out perfectly well. Almost chillingly convincing. Or convincing. Uh, I would say, I even though I'm not a big Tony Todd fan, I do like his performance in this. I think he's a great... This, He's perfect for the character. I like how they didn't show the story of Candyman. It really helped sell the idea of an urban legend. Because you know, everyone's talking about bedtime stories, campfire legends. So by not showing it in like flashback or whatever, and just having people talk about it and seeing pictures through murals, it really helps sell the effect of an urban legend story. So I thought that was a great choice to not actually show it. I actually didn't really notice it until watching it again. Um, of course, the scene and one of the best parts of the score is when he brings her to his lair in Cabrini Green, opens up his jacket, we see all the bees, and he opens his mouth to kiss her, and there's bees. Which he, all practical, they really did make a practical thing to put all the bees in. He really did put all those bees in his mouth. And they put some, like honey or some sort of attractant on them so that when they would dump the bees on it, they would stick to certain areas. And, you know, the, the chest cavity part, you know, probably was done for shock but there there's an elegance into the scene with him with him in his mouth and he goes to kiss her and he just has this look of tranquility on his face it, the, the way the score is put over it's very well done very memorable scene and you know when i think of the kind of stories clive barker does this is one of the first ones i think of you know, originally it was called the forbidden because it is kind of a forbidden love. It is a forbidden thing to do to say Candyman. <laughs> I'm going to try to stop sniffing like that. I should just blow my nose. But I hate doing that on camera. But I do like the movies where someone is put through the ringer by... and set up or framed. Whether it be by a very clever, real person or some sort of unseen, unstoppable force. Like this or uh, The New Invisible Man. I love stories like that. I put this movie off for years, but when I finally saw it, I was like, wow, this is a really damn good movie. I'd say it's one of my favorite horror movies uh, of the entire 90s. Um... I saw both sequels years ago, like shortly after I saw this. Incredibly forgetful, just as bad as some, some of the later Hellraiser remakes. Just as bad and forgettable. So if I was to review them, 
I have to watch them again, which I don't plan on doing. So, sorry for that. But my thoughts on them, they suck. Really love Candyman, though. Really, really good movie. The performances, the direction by Bernard Rose, who also wrote the screenplay. But the overall idea and story by Clive Barker. Score by Philip Glass is absolutely fan-fucking-tastic. I love it. But yeah, Candyman, great movie. Thank you for watching.